Bible and the many doctrines that uh, teach us about the Bible, inspiration, preservation, translation. And so each week we're learning these nuggets of wisdom, uh, what the Bible says about itself, how we can know that we can trust it for sure. And with that, if you will, let's start in 1 Peter chapter 1. If you'll go ahead and turn there. 1 Peter chapter number 1. And I'm going to give you a handout here in a second. And we've started in Matthew 1.1 1, 1 because Matthew 1 is the beginning of the New Testament. And the very word is Bible. That's the first word. Now, in, in the original language, it's Biblios. It says the book. And we are people of the book. And so we're going to go through the order that's laid out in Matthew 1.1 1, 1 of some doctrine that is foundational for Christian theology, and so we're going to look at the book. We're continuing through this as we have the past few weeks, and if you didn't get the handouts from last week, there are some still uh, back in there. And if you're in 1 Peter chapter 1, I want you to look at verse number 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, for all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much, and Lord, I love your word. Thank you for giving us a book that we can trust, that has all the knowledge we need for salvation and living and doctrine. Lord, I pray that you would use this time today to strengthen our faith in you and the fact that you have preserved your word, that we can hold the very words of God in our hand. Lord, I love you and I'm trusting you to help us. Please fill us with the Holy Spirit this morning so we can learn. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If I could get a couple young men to hand these out for me. <coughs> Naomi, would you get me a water, please? Thank you, sir. No, those don't need folded packs. That's okay. <laughs> Just like that. It was the bulletins we needed folded. All right. Thank you for your effort. All right. Matthew 1, 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And we're going to work through that verse over several weeks, teaching these doctrines. First, the doctrine of the book, then the generation, and then the doctrine of Jesus, the son of man, the doctrine of Christ. And then also the fulfilled prophecies of the son of David and the son of Abraham. And this morning we're talking about the doctrine of the preservation of Scripture. And last week we ended up, we were talking about inspiration, which means God breathed. And as we ended the lesson last week, we were talking about double inspiration, which is an erroneous thought. It's a theory that some have that the King James translators were actually inspired of God. And I think that's a fallacy because God breathed his word into the men that spake it originally or wrote it originally. And preservation is the secondary doctrine, the fulfillment of his prophecy to keep those words. Whereas some of your double inspiration guys would say, that they think that the King James Bible is better than the Greek or the Hebrew. Now, if you speak English, it is better for you, 100%. Um, now, there are bad versions of Greek and Hebrew that the King James Version is better than. So, let's keep that in mind. But not all King James only guys are double inspiration. There's kind of a straw man with that. Those that are high-minded scholars love to attack the double inspiration crowd. And a lot of them are, we, we know them typically as Ruckmanites, those that would follow, follow Peter Ruckman. And he had a few odd things to say on scripture. But I got to tell you, you, you think about it like this. A lot of your double inspiration guys will teach that we had lost God's word until 1611. Now the critical text, guys, thank you. The critical text guys, those that, that want to use the newer versions, they would say that God's word was lost until we found the older and better manuscripts in 1844 through Tischendorf in Sinaiticus, and then the following year, 45, with Vaticanus. Now, they still don't believe they have God's word in their hands, so I have a higher regard for a Ruckmanite or a double inspiration guy because he at least believes he has God's very words in his hands. Whereas anybody in the critical text that follows that Catholic line, the Tischendorf line, 
line, the West Cotton Hort line, Nestle Alien Text. And we're going to get all into that very soon. Uh, but they don't believe that they have God's Word. So that's very important to understand. You'll notice I have here Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. It says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now, this is God's promise. We know that he breathed in and gave us the word. We learned that last week. Now he's saying, I'm going to keep them. You will have them forever. He'll preserve them forever. This is God's promise. If you notice, I have the three legs of this concept here, the inspiration, the preservation, and the translation. I gave you examples on the first week as we cast the vision, how there are even translations in the Bible, the old being translated into the new. And so we will move on to that here in a few weeks. But today it's all about the preservation. If you notice the text here, it says the providential preservation of God's word. Now providential means that God had foresight. Yea, even that God intervened at times to protect his word. Now, we believe in a sovereign God, but he does not force anybody to be saved. That word sovereign is also often misapplied in certain ways. Where they, the Calvinists would say, God picked me to be saved or God picked me to go to hell. That's wrong. I do believe that God has personally intervened in my life to give me a red light. And I was mad that I got that red light. But then a semi-truck came barreling through and I realized I would have died and I thanked God for that red light. So I believe that was God's hand protecting me. I, you, you can't convince me otherwise. You can't convince me that it was random. I had asked for God's safety on that journey. I was in a strange city in a different state, traveling across the country, and I believe God saved my life providentially, that he preserved me, that he had foresight and had intervention, and God is in control of his creation, but yea, he will never force someone into salvation or into hell. Salvation is a free gift, and it's your choice. Everybody must choose whether or not they will take that everlasting gift. So that's what providential means. Providential preservation of God's Word is found in the Masoretic Hebrew, the traditional Greek text, often called the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text, and in English as the authorized version, 1611 through 1769, or also known as the King James Bible. There are many variations to the King James Bible simply because of updates in printing, minor printer's errors, typesetting issues, and this is, uh, you know, some I, I've seen people that dig really deep in and try to cause you to doubt, do you have the right King James Bible? If your Bible says King James Version on it, if it's the authorized, originally based on the 1611, uh, you probably have a, six, a 1769 or a 1762. We're going to get more into that in the, in the near weeks. And there are still minor differences between the two. And yet I believe God has perfectly preserved his word as we have it. Now, what I have discovered as I collect some Bibles, I have found some Bibles that don't fit either rule. They don't fit the pure Cambridge edition rule of the 62 or the Oxford 69 rule. And I find some that are more of a hybrid that different publishers have fixed the one or compiled the other into their own version. So many times you may find that somebody will say, yeah, but does it have this or that? And you go and look and it's like, well, it doesn't match either of your standards. And so I believe as God has preserved his word, he has refined it over time. The King James Bible is essentially what gave us our English language as we understand it today. And so I'm very thankful for God's inspiration, his preservation, and the translation. Now, when we talked about the inspiration last week, we talked about the verbal, which means word for word, not thought for thought. Big difference. Plenary, which means every word. It's a complete source. Everything that God gives us in the Bible is perfect. It's thorough. It's complete. And inspire, inspiration means God breathed. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's why it's important to understand the difference between inspiration and preservation. Again, there are those with the double inspiration mentality. I don't fault them as much as I do the critical text guys. However, if you want to know more accurately, the Bible gives us the two separate doctrines and they go hand in hand. I do believe that the Holy Spirit worked through the lives of the translators. 
I do. I believe some were saved and God filled them with the Spirit. I believe others may not have been saved and God still providentially used them as they prepared their life to study languages and scriptures and be available for that very time. So I believe that God has completely given us everything that we need. <coughs> You'll notice in that statement there I say the traditional Greek text. I think it's important to understand that I believe the traditional text is a better phrase than textus receptus. Because as that means received text, as you see there, many other texts have been discovered. And some people will say, well, which text is receptive? Some of your real nerdy Bible scholars that hate the preservation, they want to say we don't have God's word. Well, which text is receptus? They try to create this straw man of controversy. But the traditional text is that which has been commonly been received by the Christian church, not the Catholic church. It is what God has preserved in the majority, 5,300 fragments or copies or codexes that all agree. In fact, they say there's a 99 percentile of agreeance with the King James Bible. And yet I believe it is 100 percent perfect that God has given us exactly what we need. And we have nothing to doubt. We have the perfect Bible. It has not been perverted. Um, with that, if you look at the next section here. I showed you in 1 Peter 1, and this is important. If you look at verse 24, it says, All flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth. That's the statement I want to dial in on, that the grass wither. Doesn't grass fade away? That's what he's saying. Well, what the scriptures were originally written on was grass. Papyri is what it was called, or papyrus for plural. If you notice, if you keep moving, I have God's word is eternal. It outlives the papyrus, that's the grass, the reed paper that it was written upon. Isaiah 40 confirms this. This is what's being cited. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Isn't that something that it was written on grass, saying the grass will wither, but my word is forever? And we have what was written in Isaiah today because God's words are eternal. Isaiah 19 gives us a reference. It calls it the paper reeds. Those are the papyri reeds. That's where they were making paper from. Uh, two great verses on uh, the eternality of God's word. Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And verse 152. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. It is settled in heaven. I believe God knows exactly what he wanted in our Bible up in heaven long before we had it. Long before we had printing presses, God's word was settled in heaven. He had the foresight. He knew what needed to be said. He, knew, he knows what this generation needs. Now, again, as we were speaking last week, we have a, a book bias. We have a book problem. Um, on Friday, I gave the example. Friday, I order a book. I go on Amazon. I order a book. I get it Saturday. It tells me it was printed in Orlando on Friday. And within 24 hours, I was able to click and buy, and it's at my front door. It was printed by a robot and cut and chopped and shipped and mailed and came to my door within 24 hours. Now, guys, do you know how long it, take, it took to get copies of the Bible just 100, 200, 300 years ago, 400 years ago? It was, an, it was a long endeavor. Some of these men gave literally their whole life to being a scribe and studying the Bible and being able to copy and translate it and teach it. And that's where we, are. we should be very thankful that we can hold God's Word in our hand. I always heard it that one day they're going to make the Bible illegal. But I could say if they make cell phones so popular, they don't have to make the Bible illegal. We're all distracted with the cares of this world, aren't we? Continuing on the next section, God spoke to Moses in Exodus 20, where we get the Ten Commandments, and God spake all these words, saying, and then God, and then Moses spake to the people, Exodus 24, verse 3, and Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord hath said, we will do. Now, God spoke the words, the Ten Commandments, and then many other things after that. And Moses was able to retain it all. Now, I believe the Holy Spirit was working inside of him, fell upon him, so that he might prophesy and say what needed to be said. Then Moses wrote a book, verse 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and rose up early in the morning, and built an altar under the hill, and the twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And again, later God would write it in stone, wouldn't he? He would call him back up the mountain and he would 
put it in stone and give him what was called later the Ten Commandments. Verse number 7 in Exodus 24, it says, And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, All that the Lord hath said we will do and be obedient. You see this pattern that God speaks, and that a man speaks. A man writes it down, and then it's read out of the book. And the next generation, they don't hear directly from God, or they don't hear directly from Moses. They read what Moses wrote, and they know for sure that they have all of the words that God wanted them to have. Flip your sheet over. We'll talk a little bit about providential preservation and how the Bible speaks of itself on this topic. Uh, pr providential preservation would tell us that it is eternal and indestructible. You can destroy your Bible and think you've done something, but you're not hurting the ones on my shelf or on your house, right? And that's the devil is after it. He wants to change it. But listen, God does not forget his word. Even if man does, God knows because it's settled in heaven. I give this example out of Jeremiah Verse chapter 36, starting in verse 23, it says, And it came to pass when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he, that's the king, cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that it was on the hearth, and all until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. The men that were with him, hearing the king, he's like, No, king, don't burn it. They were trying to convince him, Don't burn it. But they did anyway. And look what God does in verse 28. Take thee again another roll. And write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. So God commands Jeremiah, write another copy. Now, do you think God forgot his word? Nope. Look at verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. Now God fired him up, and he gave him a few more chapters to add. He's like, oh, you're going to burn that? Let me give you a few more judgments against you and your kingdom for your wicked uh, actions of rejecting the word. I'll give you these two examples of how God has preserved His Word. In the Old Testament, it was through the Hebrew priesthood. Today, in the New Testament, it's through the priesthood of the believers. It's our job to keep it and learn it and memorize it and teach it. I've heard of projects where they get a bunch of pastors together and they would try to get them to write down as many verses as they could remember without any copies of the Bible. And they would come up with great volumes and nearly complete chapters and books of the Bible where they're all working together to try to remember God's Word. And uh, we're, we're so far from that. We're so distracted in this generation. I can't tell you how much power you're missing out on by reading the Bible and writing it down for yourself, this is what we've been called to do. Uh, the, the digital generation is amazing. You can pull up your phone and do a word search just like that. Whereas, I mean, just a, I mean, a couple decades ago, that was a major ordeal to do a word search from the whole Bible and try to study a particular topic. And now any kid can do it with any phone. But don't let it make us lazy. God's rules that he passed down, we see that in the Old Testament priesthood, they had many rules, parchments, which papyri was grass paper, parchments were animal skins, parchments were to be made from clean animal skins. Each column of writing must be 30 letters wide and 48 to 60 lines long. Each parchment must be a perfect copy, authenticated. The letters, words, and paragraphs had to be counted. Each page had to be an identical page. The ink must be black, made from a special recipe. Scribes would verbalize each word aloud while they were writing. Nothing was to be written from memory. If you'll get the thought, you're looking at the copy. And as you read, being, and you would say being, and write being, born, born, again, again. And you would just constantly look. I know the verse, but if I'm doing it God's way, I need to look and say and write every time, every step of the way. Also, a high regard for the name of God. It says that they must wipe the pen before writing the word Jehovah every time. Also, if there was one mistake found on the page, it condemned the whole page. And three mistakes condemns the entire manuscript. You had to scrap it and start completely over. Talk about a high standard. That way, every copy that was made was trustworthy and preserved. They kept word for word what God has inspired. What God breathed 
has now been penned down. They had it, and we have it today. The New Testament was kept by the priesthood of the believers inside the local churches. The received text traces its origins back to the faithful believers in Antioch. There in Acts eleven twenty six, 26, it says, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. If you go and read that whole chapter, you'll see they came and told them. And the church was working together to grab these doctrines and learn them and teach them to each other. Uh, we'll get into it more. We've spoke of it earlier and we'll get to it later in the next session or so about the uh, Peshitta. Just an amazing copy, Syriac, how Syriac would have, or Arabic would have been a language that was primarily used even in the time of Jesus because many of the Hebrew slaves quit speaking Hebrew. Many of the prophets would have had to interpret the Hebrew scriptures into Aramaic or Syriac, as Daniel called it, for them to be able to teach it to them. And so God has preserved his word in many languages. Um, if I can get a couple volunteers... I want to show you how to spot a fake Bible. We did this last week or the week before also. With I need, I need some young men who can read. Come on, I need some help. I need one, two, three, four, five, six. I need some volunteers if everybody will come grab one of these. We're going to start voluntolding. Justice, would you pick us some young men to come grab these Bibles and read for me? I'll be a young man. Young man? <laughs> We're going to ask your wife about that. <laughs> uh, it's not difficult. It won't be a hard text. There you go. Get Josiah away. Oh, there's Luke. All right. We got enough. Everybody grab one of those. Oh, this is a good one. How to spot a false Bible. Now, we showed you Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's not heavens plural. That's the easiest way. But if you guys will go to Luke 4.4. We talked about Genesis 1.1. Everybody find Luke 4.4. And, you know, the Bible tells us in John, I think it's 10, that the Scripture cannot be broken. Well, there are some Bibles that are broken. And so let's see how to spot one. Um, in Luke 4.4, 4, I'll read it to you. And Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. All right, if you have it, go ahead and read it. You have it? Luke 4.4, 4. go ahead, sir. And Jesus answered him, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And that's the John MacArthur ESV. So it doesn't have every word of God. All right. What do you have for us, Landon? Says, Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. But it doesn't have every word of God. Which version is that? This is the, the New American Bible. All right. What do you have? New World Translation. New World Order Translation. Okay. <laughs> but Jesus answered him, it is written, man must not live on bread alone. But it doesn't have every word of God. You see, you see the pattern here, right? Go ahead, Noah. And Jesus answered it, and answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And that's the NIV, the no inspired verses version, okay? And what do you, Justice, what do you have there? Um, Tree of Life version. That's not the whole name of it. What's the whole? Uh, Messiah. Messianic, Messianic Jewish Family Bible Tree of Life version. Boy, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Does it have every word of God? Yeshua answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. You might as well call this thing the Yiddish Bible. It changed God's name while it was at it, all right? All right, what else do we have? And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. But it doesn't have every word of God. All right, what version is that? Legacy Standard. The Legacy Standard Bible. You guys can put those back. That's the John MacArthur's new translation, the LSB. It is not a legacy. It's brand new. It's not a standard. Even the Calvinist scholars are rejecting it, but he specifically attacked God's word as he used the critical text. So Genesis 1.1 is the easiest way to spot a false Bible. Luke 4.4 4 is also a great way to spot a false Bible. They don't have every word of God. Therefore, they don't have a preserved Bible. There at the end on your handout, Matthew 5, verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. God is telling us, I mean, dotting the I and crossing the T, he says, I've given it all and I'm going to keep it all. Now, the problem is there are a lot of false Bibles out there. 
or perhaps that certain languages are struggling in their translation ability and they don't have everything in order. The Spanish Bible is a pretty big deal. I was speaking with a a Bible publishing company this week, one of the few that actually literally publishes and prints them here in America. And he was telling me, I was telling, so we, we get these uh, free gift New Testaments. I don't think I have one up here. But there's an error in it. And I was telling, yeah, here it is. And so there's an error in it that, we, that I spotted and I told the publisher. And this other publisher I was speaking to, they have the same name, but it's a totally different organization. And right away, he's like, that's not us. I'm like, oh, yeah? And then I'm like, oh, sure enough, it isn't. They have a different product. And he said, we have a letter on our wall where one of our guys wrote Oxford. And the Oxford Bible for 40 years since it was published, this particular rendition, has had a typo. And one of our guys found it. And we have an acknowledgement. I'm sorry, it was Cambridge. We have an acknowledgement from Cambridge that their pure Cambridge edition had a typo, and we're, we're kind of proud of it. We framed it and put it on the wall. We got this letter back that we found an error. Um, in this particular Bible, in Titus 1, 2, where it should say, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God promised eternal life. He cannot lie. Well, for some reason, this version has the word the inserted there, in the hope of eternal life, which it doesn't really change anything, but it's just not right. Now, does that mean that we've lost God's word because some program or some printer somewhere added a word that didn't belong here? When I was speaking to this gentleman about it, he said, you understand, there is no software that's really capable of accurately editing this. He said, if you copy this text and you put it in a word document processor, it's going to mess it up. It doesn't, it doesn't have uh, the King's English, if you will, as it did there. And so we, it is a manual process for every piece, and it needs to be double-checked and triple-checked. And that's what the local church does. That's what Christian believers do through the power of the Holy Spirit. You pray and you search and you read. And so uh, we're going to be getting our next batch of Bibles from this other company. Much better outfit, by the way. So looking forward to getting those ordered actually this week. So that was kind of neat to be able to talk with them about some of those things. Uh, Mark 13, 31, they're at the end of your page. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Mark 13 is famous because it's what's commonly called the Olivet Discourse. It's where Jesus was answering the question, what will be the sign of your coming? Now, they were standing there with him, but they said, what will be the sign of the end of the world? They knew. He said, I would go away, and I'll come back. And they knew those things. They understood, but not entirely. And he says in that passage, heaven and earth, one day it's going to fall away. This earth and the heaven that the angels are in right now, one day it's all going to melt with a fervent heat. But yet there's a new heaven and a new earth, and God's word, because it is settled in heaven, breathed by God, and kept by providential power of the Lord, it will never be lost. If God wants to print a copy in the new earth, he can do it. I kind of have the theory, once we have a resurrected state, once we pass, we're absent from the body and present with the Lord, I get a feeling like God just sticks it in our hard drive. And it's like everybody, we, we get the whole thing in our brain and we have supernatural understanding as we're prepared to serve him for eternity. That's my theory. But heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. I want you to have great, great faith in that statement. God loves you so much. He gave you a book. And in it, it tells you all the matters of life, all the issues of life, mostly salvation. Isn't that the most important thing? Wouldn't it be a horrible thing if we were unsure about our salvation? We were talking about Augustine earlier. Talk about perverting doctrine. Boy, that guy really messed some stuff up, didn't he? I mean, he really messed some stuff up, but all the Catholics are confused because of him. Well, do we baptize babies or do we not? Does that enter us into the covenant? Does my, do I have free will in the flesh? Do I have free will in the spirit? He taught all sorts of crazy doctrine, and it's not just him. If our authority was a church structure, some hierarchy, yea, even the man behind the pulpit, we could be in trouble, couldn't we? 
because we're all flesh and we're all failures in certain areas of life. But guys, I want to encourage you, you have the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit inside of you, He will lead you and guide you into all truth. You have no need that any man teach you, He says. And yet we do, we teach just as Moses did. We're going to write it and read it and teach it until the Lord comes. And we have great confidence what He has given us. This is where all the power is at. This is where the authority is at. And you can stand on your own two feet. You can embrace the Word of God and get it in your heart and let the Holy Spirit work and speak it out of your mouth. You too can help save souls and teach doctrine and fulfill the Great Commission. What a great thing that we have the perfect, preserved Word of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. And Lord, again, we do. We love your book. Lord, I love what you're doing here at this church. I thank you for getting us all here safely. Lord, I pray that you would just fill us with your Holy Spirit today and help us to be loving and kind and caring to one another. Lord, I pray for those that are on their way. Help us to comfort them. We love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're dismissed.